I was a fighter pilot flying missions in Vietnam in 1967. Went over in the summer of 67, and then November, I was about halfway through my tour. As I'd flown 53 combat missions over North Vietnam, and my airplane was hit and blew up. And my partner and I, there were two in the airplane. We were both uh, had to parachute over enemy territory. We were captured immediately uh, by the gunners on the ground there and taken to Hanoi and incarcerated in that and in the infamous Hanoi Hilton the Hualo prison there. I went in just for a marker. I went in 11 days after John McCain. We came home on the same airplane. And tell me what you do now. Well, I'm a leadership consultant. I've had my own leadership consulting company for the last uh, uh, 15 years, and I really enjoy that. It fits well. I, I was a leader at a lot of levels in the Air Force after the war, and then uh, my last two assignments, my last six years in the Air Force, I ran leadership schools for Air Force officers and officer development. So it was a good fit. And then I got into assessment, which made it even better. I do a lot of leadership assessment also. So I'm understanding human nature, understanding leadership and leadership principles. And so I do executive team building, executive coaching, leadership uh, workshops, and, and then also motivational speaking. In that time, who were the leaders that made the most impact on you and why? Yeah, well, that was a very difficult situation, especially if you were a leader. And we had some great ones that really didn't make a difference for all of us. Colonel Robbie Reisner, later General Robbie Reisner after the war, was the senior ranking officer. And he was just an incredible leader, very courageous, as they all were, and uh, high standards. But the leaders there went through first and most often the torture. Some of these guys, uh, most of them were from the came in the military right after World War II or right as World War II was ending, so they were kind of the old generation. But they were in their early 40s, very young by my standards today. But they were very experienced, and they were well-schooled in leadership and very courageous. And that made all the difference in the world because they created a climate or a culture there of leading with honor, as I call it, and set a standard that our goal was to return with honor. So they, as the senior leaders like Colonel Reisner, Commander Stockdale, Commander Denton, those were the three primary ones that were the senior ranking officers. And when one was out of commission and out of communication, the other one would take over. Maybe be in another camp, one would take over. So they really set the stage by uh, taking torture to resist the enemy, bouncing back, resisting again, taking torture again, and always uh, leading the group, still functioning as leaders. So it was uh, amazing. And that kind of rippled down, you know. The leader always sets the pace, and that rippled down. So leaders beneath them did the same, and we all tried to live up to that. You talk about having purpose and passion. You were a fighter pilot. Pilots seem to have a a lifetime vision from a young age. But what advice do you have for those who find their calling late in life, and are they capable of the same intensity and depth of commitment? Yes and no. Colonel Sanders didn't start frying chickens until he was in his 60s and became very world famous, you know, his brand. So, yes, you definitely can find it later in life. And sometimes it's through trial and error. Sometimes it's through that opportunity that opens up in front of you and you step into it. I do think some people are more passionate about certain aspects of their uh, direction. For instance, I found that some, you know, store managers, we did some research on store managers in various parts of the country and for this nationwide organization. We found out there were some similarities to most of them, but there was one group that was different, and they were passionate about having a good-looking store that was uh, inviting and the products were well demonstrated or available and so on. And that made a big difference for them and their success. So the passion can sometimes come from different things. I'm about helping people grow and develop. So I'm developing products and giving training and speeches to help people grow and develop. So helping people become better leaders is a strong part of my passion. But with that, that drive enables me to develop products and write books and so on. So sitting down and writing a book would not be something I would normally wake up one day and say, well, I'd just like to sit down and write a book because I don't like to sit still and I like projects that can be started and finished more quickly. But because I'm so passionate about my message and we have software now for, you know, writing with, you know, just word processors and all, it makes it a lot easier and I can work my way through a book. But even there, I have to divide it into chapters and I work a chapter at a time or a part of a chapter at a time so I can feel like I've accomplished something because I like to to accomplish things. Mm -hmm. There's a drive for that as well.
In government, much leadership changes with each new administration. Uh Um, What advice would you give to career feds on how to stay anchored, as you say in the book, as the political appointees cycle through their agencies? That's a tough one, and I think you have to you have to have a, a dual mentality in, in one way. And I've been in this situation. I worked for some generals that cycle through, and in one way, you have to have a commitment to support that person and give them your complete loyalty. At the same time, you recognize that they may not know as much as you do. Usually, you know, senior people are not going to know as much as the action. We call them action officers the project managers. They're not going to know as much, and if they're smart, they know that, and they know to listen to the project managers. So you want to help them out and help them be smart as quick as you can, and hopefully they'll be listening. But on the the other hand, these senior officers or senior political appointees are going to be the decision makers. So you want to try to provide them good information, support them 100%. And my rule is, you know, I may disagree with my boss, and if I do, I'll tell them. But then once I've told them, I've absolved myself of the responsibility of a bad decision because I've given them my best insights into it. If they want to do something else, that's their prerogative. But as long as it's not illegal, as long as it's not professionally unethical, in other words, if it's legal and it's ethical and it's and it's moral that, you know, 99% of the people would say it's a moral decision uh, in the right way, then I support them 100%. But if it's illegal or unethical, then I'm not going to support them. So I think you owe them that loyalty. And if you see your boss is doing something that looks a little bit unethical, you ought to say, hey, can we talk about that? Because some things are close enough and people are emotionally involved and they don't see, you know, they can't see sometimes exactly where they are. And so just having a conversation, can we talk about that? You know, help me understand how this is an ethical thing to do. And I've said that to people. Can you talk a little bit about fear? How did you overcome fear as a POW and how does that translate to the workplace? Wow, fear is a huge thing in the workplace, I'll tell you. It's uh, one of the biggest derailer of leadership and performance of all kinds in the workplace and in our lives. So, I thought I was pretty tough. You know, I had flown 53 combat missions over enemy territory of the highest order, and I didn't have a lot of fear there. But facing a communist interrogator face-to-face when you have no power, no control, and they have control over your life and your food and your shelter and all that sort of stuff, that took a a different kind of courage than I'd really ever had to use before. And so I did okay, but I didn't do as well as I wanted to sometimes. But I had a leader who was my immediate leader was Captain Ken Fisher, and he was mentally tougher than I was. He'd been a wrestler, and he was six years older, and I think that made a little difference. And I just learned from him. I watched him, and I just kept pushing myself. I finally developed this philosophy that I teach now, which is lean into the pain of your fear to do what you know is right. And to me, that that helps me understand what I need to do. If I see what's the right thing to do and I know that I'm afraid, I need, need to have the courage to lean into that fear and just keep moving ahead to do the right thing one step at a time. And when I see uh, leaders today, you know, so many of them are being taken out. You know, we had uh, a lot of this VA stuff, you know, they were afraid of their bosses in some cases, so they were giving them good numbers to please the boss rather than saying, hey, the reality is we can't do that or Maybe we need to be more creative and figure out a way to do this. But taking the easy way out and then being afraid of the truth gets people in trouble. We had that in Atlanta where we had school teachers and school administrators who were cheating on the test because they didn't want their students to get bad grades because then they wouldn't get promoted or wouldn't get their bonuses or all that kind of stuff. Rather than deal with the real issue, they were cheating. So it can happen to good people, and it does every day, and it takes them out. So learning to confront your fears, to just keep doing what's right, is so important in today's world. Now, you say in your book that building cohesive teamwork is not the kind of challenge that most results-oriented leaders enjoy. Why is that, and why is it worth the effort? To have cohesive teams, you need trust. And to get trust, you have to have relationships, which means you have to know people. And that takes time, getting to know people, which means you get to know something about them personally and uh, develop insights about them and build a relationship. Well, that's kind of a soft thing to some people. Highly results-oriented people think that's just a waste of time. That's just fluff. Even though intuitively they may know it's right and maybe in a class they heard it's right, it just feels uncomfortable. And for them, it is a fear. It's a fear of being uncomfortable and being out of off balance and maybe not handling it well, and so they don't want to go there. And I mean, I've coached people 
this way quite often. So getting them to engage with their people and build those relationships, and not just them with the leader with the people, but the people on the team together themselves, takes some sort of social activities usually. Uh, where people are kind of letting their hair down and being real with each other and getting to know each other uh, above and beyond just, uh, you know, signing papers and passing things around that you normally do at work. So that's why, you know, that that relationship building time is essential, but it's just not a comfort zone for a lot of highly results-oriented people. Now, the smart ones learn to do it. And anybody can learn to do it. It's just, it's like the relationship person who has to have a difficult conversation. That feels very uncomfortable to them, just like the, the building relationships feels uncomfortable to the results oriented person. One more question for you. Mm-hmm. You recently returned to Hanoi. What was that like? Going back to Hanoi, I had a lot of mixed emotions. Um, I had a very good experience going to the real Hilton, the Hilton Hanoi uh, Opera House, which is uh, about two blocks from the old. Uh, Wallow Prison, which we called the Hanoi Hilton back in those days. So I went there and had lunch, and then we went back to the prison. And about a third of it still remains. It's been made into a museum. And that was a heavy, oppressive experience in every way you can imagine. Being back in that place and, you know, being in some of the old cells where they showed how the French treated them. They didn't show the Americans being treated bad in those cells. They showed the French Mm. treating them badly. And then we got down to a couple of rooms where it was all about how terrible the U.S. bombing was and then how wonderful they treated the American POWs, which was all a propaganda lie. In fact, they had photo op propaganda photos in there to show, to document how well that we've been treated. You know, like once a year, twice a year, we got a a decent meal served on a tray. You had a tray to go pick it up, and the cameraman would step out from around the corner as you picked up your tray and snap a picture, and that became the way we ate every day. So it was just, uh, you know, oppressive to encounter the old prison, but also the communist lies. I think the worst thing about it was just realizing how communism is so built on lies. And when I see that trend coming, not necessarily the trend of communism, but the trend of ideologies and parties being built on lies, it just uh, it really upsets me. And I came home with a new commitment to, to the truth and trying to show people why every time a lie is told, some of our freedom is taken away.